so this will be the most, uh, I guess I would call it sort of biological uh, of the lectures, uh, since it's sort of starting at the beginning, um, sort of an introduction to the rest of the lectures, but also just general concepts of RNA-seq. Uh, and this one tends to sometimes have quite a bit of discussion, so that everyone here is from a, sort of a different area of expertise. Their projects are all different. They have different perspectives on uh, the different sort of flavors of RNA-seq, and so we're going to go through some of the the nuances of what it means to do an RNA-seq experiment and some of the sort of the major flavors of it. Uh, and if you guys have comments or questions um, as we go, then, uh, please, you know, speak up. Um, uh, and we'll, it's, it's fine and, and good to have a bit of a discussion uh, while we're going through these lectures. Uh, it makes them more uh, interactive and interesting. Um, so before, before I start with the first slide, um, want to do something similar to what Obi did, which is sort of get a bit of a sense of sort of more of the specifics of the of what you guys are doing. Um, so how many people here are doing RNA-seq or interested in doing RNA-seq for human? So that's me. Whoa, okay. So I guess about half of you are humans. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of you, well, we're going to find out. Okay, what are the rest of you? Um, uh, how about just some other eukaryote, like a mouse or yeast or whatever? Okay, so you guys are still interested in the splicing intron aspect of, of RNA-seq. Um, any plants? It's a eukaryote, but sort of for other reasons in a special category. Okay, so one, two, three, yeah, three. Wow, okay. So, yeah, that sucks for you guys. Um, <laughs> depending on which plant it is. So the plants, plants are sort of infamously nasty genomes, very complicated. Some of them are just huge and polyploid and all kinds of craziness going on. So what, what are the plants quickly, just those three people? I'm actually looking at polyploid. Yeah, so you're definitely screwed. <laughs> Fire, in fireweed? Yeah. Oh, cool. That's really neat. Um, Eric, area, it's, it's in the breast cancer family. It has a, triple, a recent triploid mutant. So okay. And the third one? Looking at the unicellular green algae. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. Um, so yeah, so quite a mix. Um, who? So the human people definitely have a reference genome, but for the non-human uh, people, do you all have reference genomes? Does anyone not have a reference genome for their species? One, two, okay, kind of. So generally, right? Okay, and then what would be the closest for fireweed? So not having a reference genome generally has you know, uh, quite an effect on the, the way you approach uh, the analysis of RNA-seq data uh, because there are quite a lot of tools and pipelines that sort of assume that you have a reference genome or at least one that's sort of a, of a closely related species. Uh, and so we're gonna, at, at points we're going to talk about some of the things you would do if you didn't have a reference genome, but really this course is, is quite focused on on the scenario where you do have a reference genome, there's, but there's a few pieces that we've added here and there to just sort of uh, do reference-free uh, analysis. Um, how many people have their data already? Or okay, and then there are some people that are sort of in the planning phases, or they're going to be getting data. Um, so possibly libraries are still being made, or you're deciding how to make your libraries. This kind of thing. Okay, all right. So this this is going to be potentially, I hope, uh, a helpful uh, exercise for you, because we're going to talk about some of these things. Um, so this is just a, a review of where, we at, where we're at. So we just did the introduction to cloud computing. Now we're going to go through an introduction to RNA sequencing itself. This is the sort of second of five modules, which are numbered 0 through 4 in a sort of very computer science kind of way. Um, the tutorials, so each le uh, lecture will be accompanied by a tutorial. All of the tutorials are going to be done using the, the wiki at rnaseq.wiki. Um, and we've tried to create these tutorials with a few sort of basic principles in mind. Uh, one is to, to provide a sort of working example of a functional RNA-seq analysis pipeline that's kind of from end to end. Um, and so the emphasis there is to try to not, to make it sort of real world or not some sort of imaginary pipeline, but a pipeline that you might actually use. Um, uh, but one caveat to that is that the data that we run it on can't be real data because then it won't run in a reasonable amount of time for a sort of teaching setting. So we want to execute a command that say, hey, I'm going to 
align my reads to a reference genome, uh, and I don't want that to take eight hours because we would have a lot of time to stand here waiting eight hours, uh, and then the course wouldn't get done. So we've created this sort of idealized or sort of dumbed down data sets that allow us to get through a workflow using real data files, executing all the same commands that you would otherwise execute with the big files, but it's just everything's gonna happen much faster. Uh, but you just have to keep that in mind when you're looking at the results and interpreting the results that it's sort of this um, idealized scenario where the data set is very, very small and we've so decided to select reads that only map to a small chromosome. Um, so it, it's gonna look a little bit different than your full data set will. It's gonna look a little bit cleaner and smaller and sort of simpler uh, potentially than sort of a real world large data set. Uh, and then as much as possible, we've also tried to make uh, the tutorials and all the files associated with them like fairly self-contained, hopefully self-explanatory and documented in place so that when you go back, um, you can of course listen to these, these recordings again, but the hope is that everything that you need to understand what's going on is sort of in place. Uh, and then in cases where that's, that's not clear, uh, we'd really appreciate your feedback to, to make that uh, more clear in the future. Uh, and then by self-contained, we, we mean that we're going to try to s explain everything about the setup of the tools, the environment, et cetera, that you would need. Um, so we've, in the past, we've had issues where workshops, uh, a lot of things were kind of done for you. So tools were installed and configured, and there was this elaborate machine that was sort of built for you, and someone sat you in front of that machine, and they said, okay, here's how you run RNA-seq. You press this button, and all this amazing stuff happens. Um, but you didn't know how to build that machine. So you go back to your lab and it's like, well, I don't even know what we were working on. Like, you know, so we've tried to provide the instructions to like recreate the environment that, that is being used here uh, and to actually show you what it's like to some degree to create that environment in the first place. Uh, so this module specifically is really going to talk about the theory and practice of RNA sequencing. We're going to do a little bit of just rationale for sequencing RNA. Most of you are already sort of on board with the concept of RNA sequencing. That's why you're here. Uh, but it's still kind of useful to think about the sort of uh, the reasons we do RNA sequencing. Uh, we're going to really spend some time talking about the challenges that are specific to RNA-seq as opposed to perhaps other types of sequencing. Um, so there's uh, an issue sometimes that comes up where people have done some DNA sequencing and they've done some analysis and then they try to apply the same uh, approaches to RNA-seq. And generally that is fine, but there are just a few sort of caveats or nuances to RNA-seq that you really want to keep in mind uh, that are distinct from other types of uh, sequence analysis. Uh, we're going to review the general goals and themes of RNA-seq analysis workflows uh, using the sort of our example as a uh, sort of proof of principle. We're going to talk about some of the common technical questions related to RNA-seq analysis and point you to some uh, resources to help you uh, get help outside of this course or for questions that we may not get a, a chance to cover. Uh, and then we'll do a brief introduction to the first tutorial to sort of get you used to what these tutorials are going to be like before we jump into running commands at the command line uh, with actual data, uh, tools, etc. So this is really the, the, the basic biological introduction to uh, RNA-seq just to make sure we're all on the same page. So this is, a, of course, a, a eukaryotic example where we have uh, a hypothetical gene model. Sorry, I can't point at both of these screens at the same time. Uh, we're starting with a hypothetical gene model at the top, which is a double-stranded genomic DNA template, and a, a number of features are sort of enumerated in this, this pictograph, where we have, uh, in this case, a gene with three exons uh, and two introns. Uh, these introns are not to scale for humans, so in human, the introns would be much, much larger relative to the exons. Uh, something might, like yeast might have a gene that looks kind of like this. Um, and there's a promoter region where transcription factors uh, will sit down and start to transcribe. Um, uh, and then there are features uh, that sort of signal when transcription should stop and where a poly A tail should be added if it's a polyadenylated uh, transcript. Uh, after you get, uh, so a tr transcription uh, complex will come along and make a single-stranded pre-mRNA molecule uh, from this DNA template. So now we have this single-stranded RNA molecule uh, where the introns are still in place. Uh, and in the second panel, we have some of the, the splicing regulatory features enumerated. So these are the, the, the sequence features that allow the splicing machinery to tell where the exons end and the introns start so that the introns can be spliced out and the exons can be assembled uh, into a mature mRNA molecule, which is uh, capped and polyadenylated, which is shown in, in the third panel. So now we have this mature mRNA. This is kind of uh, getting closer to the, the subject of RNA sequencing. Uh, are these RNA molecules? 
uh, and we'll often do something to enrich for the, the mature mRNA molecules. But it's important to remember that, that in RNA-seq, this is not, uh, strictly speaking, the thing that is being sequenced directly. Um, first of all, we're not actually sequencing RNA, we're sequencing uh, cDNA, uh, so it's going to get converted uh, to cDNA, usually double-stranded cDNA. Uh, and second, the next generation sequencing platforms produce short reads uh, that are much, much shorter than the average transcript in most species. Uh, so there's almost always a fragmentation step where uh, full-length RNA molecules are broken into pieces. And it's those pieces that we're sequencing. And then we're generally not even sequencing those entire pieces. We're usually sequencing a little piece on the end of one of those fragments, or we're sequencing part of both ends of the fragments, but we're not really sequencing the entire fragment. Um, but that's sort of what we're, we're imagining we're doing, or we're trying to pretend that we're going to do, and that we're going to use the analysis to try to, to make it seem as if we just sequenced uh, the RNA molecules that were there. Uh, and then, uh, of course, many of these RNA molecules in, encode for a protein, and often that's what we really care about. Uh, and so just to complete the picture, we show a, a protein sequence here, which uh, then gets folded, and it gets... Uh, modified in various ways with post-translational modifications. So of course that's a very important piece too that we're, we're sort of using potentially in a lot of cases RNA as a proxy for uh, studying actual protein function. Uh, and we're sort of doing a, a lot of inference. So you can see there's various forms of inference that are going on here. Uh, and it's useful to, to keep those in mind when you're analyzing, interpreting the data. Uh, this is sort of a really high level uh, view of what an RNA sequencing workflow looks like sort of from the lab to where analysis starts. Uh, so we have some samples of interest. So for example, we might have uh, a tumor and a normal. So this is a lot of what Obi and I do. Uh, in our uh, exercises, we're actually going to be comparing two sort of um, arbitrarily different tissues. Uh, one is a universal human reference uh, RNA sample, which is sort of a mix of RNAs collected from various human tissues. Uh, and then the other is a brain reference sample, which is a mix of different brain tissues that were combined together. So this is a very kind of spurious comparison to do, uh, which we're just doing for the purposes of, of demonstrating the concepts of RNA-seq and differential expression analysis and so on. Uh, but whatever your samples are, you're going to isolate RNA from them, uh, and then you're going to generally do some kind of... Uh, uh, library construction procedure that involves, not necessarily in this order, uh, generating cDNA, fragmenting, uh, selecting those fragments to be a sort of a, within a certain size range, uh, adding linkers onto the ends of those uh, cDNA fragments, uh, and then sequencing those fragments on an Illumina flow cell. Uh, so it used to be there was various platforms. Generally, everyone now is doing Illumina sequencing. Um, so the people that have data now, is there anyone who's using a platform other than Illumina? Like, Ion Torrent or PacBio? Okay, so PacBio is quite different. Um, the PacBio produces much, much longer reads uh, and it has a, a fairly distinct um, uh, way that it actually works compared to the Illumina sequence by synthesis. Uh, anyone else? Okay, um, and for the people that have Illumina data, are they generally paired end or single end reads? Does anyone have single or is it all paired? It's all paired. And what kind of read length? I had both. Yeah, both. Okay. Uh, and then read length, does anyone have reads that are, say, shorter than 100 bases? Okay. Two? 75. 75? Okay. Okay. So that gives you sort of, that's pretty representative if you ask sort of 10 people that have RNA-seq data. You'll see a bit of variation in how long the reads are. Sometimes there's paired reads. Sometimes there's a mix of paired and single-end reads. Uh, sometimes there are other minor variations. Um, but it's sort of, sort of, we're sort of converging on a, a fairly standardized approach that's sort of 75 to 125 base pair reads, and the paired end reads are very popular. Uh, and by paired end, I mean that you have some fragment where you're sequencing a little bit of both ends, uh, which is what's being depicted here at the bottom with the sort of blue and red uh, sequences. Um, so we're going to produce this pile, often a very, very massive pile of these paired end sequences. Uh, and then those things are going to get uh, aligned back to uh, some kind of uh, reference sequence, uh, which can be a reference genome or re reference transcriptome sequences or some combination of those things. Uh, and there are other uh, different games that people play. Uh, and then the downstream analysis is going to continue from that point. So 
why would you sequence RNA? So there's lots of sort of contexts uh, in which people would be sequencing RNA. A lot of it is sort of functional work where uh, you may ha have the sequence of a genome, but uh, the, the transcriptome gives you much more of a functional readout of the effect of environmental uh, changes. So you could have something like drug-treated versus untreated cell lines or a wild type versus a knockout my mouse. Um, predicting transcript sequence from the genome is re really difficult. So this used to be kind of a whole field of, of bioinformatics was to sequence a reference genome and then to try to predict what gene structures looked like based on the genome sequence. You try to predict, okay, what looks like an exon? How might those exons be assembled into an RNA transcript? And then what would the protein look like? But doing all of this just by looking at the reference genome sequence. So this is something that was fundamentally revolutionized by the advent of RNA-seq, that it's just actually much easier to just sequence the transcripts directly than to try to infer what they would look like uh, from the genome. That's a, a very challenging uh, approach. Um, of course, some molecular features can only be observed at the RNA level, things like alternative isoforms, uh, fusion transcripts, RNA editing. Um, in the cancer realm, interpreting mutations that don't have an obvious effect at the, at the protein sequence level can be aided by RNA-seq where you can try to look for regulatory mutations uh, and then you can try to prioritize uh, mutations that are in exons according to whether they're expressed or not. And that's sort of a niche example that's quite specific to uh, cancer genomics. Um, there are a number of challenges that are quite particular to RNA-seq compared to sort of other sequencing um, like chip seq, whole genome exome sequencing, etc., um, and then there are other things that are quite common. Uh, so things like relating to the sample, uh, purity of the sample. So if it's sort of contaminated with something else, so using the tumor example, it may be contaminated with normal tissue, and that of course influences uh, interpretation of the result. Uh, RNA quantities can be limiting. Uh, RNA is sort of infamously fragile, so some amount of RNA degradation is sort of uh, part of the life of anyone who works with RNA, uh, with the possible exception of people who work exclusively in cell lines. Um, so how many people here would say that uh, RNA quality is like a serious challenge in, in their work? Okay, so several. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, it's often just simply because of the, the type of experiment that's being done, it's simply not possible to get really beautiful, intact uh, RNA. And so you're you're left with sort of dealing with the, the challenges that, that that introduces. Another thing about RNA is that they often consist of uh, small exons that are separated by large introns. So this is quite a difference uh, in the analysis when you compare it to, say, whole genome sequencing, where when you're mapping your read, which is generated from a cDNA fragment, which came from an RNA molecule, you're mapping that thing back to a reference genome, the aligner needs to account for the possibility that that read may span across an intron. So instead of trying to find the place in the reference genome that these 100 bases match to uh, more accurately than anywhere else in the reference genome, it has to consider the possibility that 25 of those bases might match here and 75 of them might match 10 KB downstream where the, the next exon continues. And that's a big challenge uh, for the alignment algorithms. It's much, much harder than just saying, okay, what's the one place that this thing goes contiguously uh, when you have to say, well, I expect that in a significant proportion of my alignments, the, the alignment will actually be discontiguous and there will be this potentially very large, you know, introns can be huge in humans. They can be up to 100 KB. Um, so that's, there's a, a big search space, basically. Uh, and you can imagine that if that overlap, uh, across the intron into the next exon is really small, it gets harder and harder to, to place that little bit that's spilled over into the next exon. Uh, so that's uh, one of the challenges that the RNA-seq specific aligners try to address. Uh, something that is often uh, sort of glossed over or forgotten about uh, is that the relative abundance of ver RNAs vary wildly within a sample. Uh, so estimates vary, but in human, you'll often see estimates in sort of in the 10 to 5 to 10 to the 7 orders of magnitude uh, difference in abundance between the most highly expressed RNA and the most lowly expressed RNA that is still biologically functional in that tissue. Uh, so this is very, very different from DNA sequencing where you have some complement of chromosomes and you expect approximately equal representation of each of those chromosomes. So in human, you have two copies of each chromosome. Uh, and so when you sequence and you randomly shotgun sequence reads and you align them back to the reference genome, you're expecting coverage to be kind of approximately even across uh, the reference genome. 
And the transcriptome, this is not the situation at all. You expect some things to be very, very heavily sequenced and other things to be very lowly sequenced. Uh, hopefully very proportional to how abundant they are in the sample. Uh, and so this is a challenge because RNA sequ sequencing works by random sampling. So you have the situation that a small fraction of really highly expressed genes uh, consume a lot of your the reads that you have. So you have this fixed pool of say 50 million reads because that's what you can afford to generate um, and 40 million of them are going to get consumed by the top most highly expressed gene. So if your gene happen of interest happens to be a gene that's not so highly expressed, uh, you may not get good coverage. You may not sample it very well. So this come, really comes into estimating how much data you need to produce. Uh, and it's something that's quite different from DNA sequencing. Um, and then you have things like ribosomal and mitochondrial genes uh, where there's often in the lab some attempt to actually uh, filter these out and enrich for other things to sort of reduce this problem that you don't just want to sequence ribosomal RNA to death and then not really learn anything about the rest of the transcriptome. Uh, another issue that's, uh, again, quite different from DNA sequencing is that RNAs come in a wide range of sizes, uh, and they function at, in those size ranges. So you can have really, really small RNAs that are important, like microRNAs that are just a few tens of bases long, uh, and then you can have uh, mRNAs that are very, very large. They can be 30, 40, 50 kb in size, uh, and some of those produce massive proteins. Um, and again, this is quite different from DNA sequencing, where generally the chromosomes are all quite large in terms of working with uh, uh, molecules and molecular biology. Uh, and then this introduces some complexities in the, the RNA-seq uh, library construction procedure, where you, you have to handle very small RNAs differently than the, sort of the rest of the RNAs. Uh, and then it gives you a sort of representation challenge that uh, just like there are RNA, RNAs that are very highly abundant and other RNAs that are very rare in your sample, uh, and that gives them sort of a different probability of being hit by a random RNA-seq read. The same sort of principle applies to small versus large RNAs. It's easier to sort of capture and represent at least some amount, a large RNA, than it is a small RNA, uh, because there are more fragments that you can derive from that large RNA. Uh, so it's just sort of at an advantage, fundamentally, in the, the data generation. Uh, and then we already talked about the, the fragility of RNA that's easily degraded. Uh, something you'll see a lot in RNA-seq experiments uh, are these Agilent traces. Uh, so is there, does everyone uh, use Agilent? How many people are familiar with the, the Agilent assay for assessing RNA quality? Okay, so maybe like a third of you. So this is a really common uh, tool that's used um, to assess the um, how intact uh, and also abundant your RNA sample is. So you do RNA isolation and it's very common to, to run it on a, an Agilent, uh, which is kind of like running it on a gel, except you're running it through a capillary uh, gel electrophoresis. Uh, and then you're getting a readout over time as, as that sort of gel is run through this capillary. Uh, and the, the smallest RNAs come out first and the largest RNAs come out later. And over time, it gives you this trace that has this sort of spiky pattern to it. Uh, and when the RNA is total RNA, so this is a human example, you'll have peaks corresponding to the ribosomal, ribosomal RNAs, uh, which account for about 95% of all RNAs uh, in your sample. Uh, and you can use the, the sort of the strength of those two peaks as an indication of how intact the RNA is. So since we know to expect about 95% of the RNAs correspond to molecules that are about these two sizes, um, if the RNA is intact, we should see two nice big peaks corresponding to those sizes. Uh, if the RNA is degraded, uh, we'll start to see more and more peaks as we basically have evidence that those RNAs have been broken into smaller and smaller pieces. So the, the image you're seeing on the right is sort of a perfect RNA sample that I isolated from a cell line. The one on the left is a much more challenging RNA uh, sample that I isolated from uh, an actual human tumor sample. Uh, and you can see sort of the difference between completely intact and sort of partially degraded RNA. Uh, and this Agilent assay will give you a score based on the sort of area under these, these two uh, peaks uh, and a RIN score. So you'll commonly hear sequencing uh, cores talk about these RIN scores uh, and perhaps having some sort of minimum cutoff where they won't accept your sample if it's below a certain quality level. Uh, RIN of 10, it sort of indicates completely intact, perfect RNA. And as you get closer and closer to zero, that means the RNA is more and more degraded. Uh, and I provided a link here of 
50 or 100 um, RNA samples that uh, I've worked with over the years that are covering sort of a wide gambit of what these traces look like from really, really intact to completely degraded from different types of preparations, from FFP material, from fresh frozen material, from cell lines, et cetera. And so it gives you sort of an idea of what the landscape looks like. Uh, a lot of cores have sort of arbitrarily chosen a RIN score of eight to be sort of a cutoff that if the RIN score is below eight, they'll want you to kind of either give you a different, give them a different sample or at least sign off that the data quality may be affected in a negative way and you're not gonna come back to them complaining that your data uh, is inadequate. Uh, general design considerations. So we included this link to the uh, OnCode RNA-Seq uh, standards document that was developed a number of years ago. It has not been updated to my knowledge, but it's still a pretty good resource for just sort of generally introducing you to some uh, best practices and things to think about with regard to uh, what kind of metadata to store in your RNA-Seq experiments, um, the importance of replicates, uh, how much sequencing depth to target, control experiments to include, uh, standards for reporting your results and so forth. Uh, and there have been a number of uh, additional initiatives that have got underway over the last couple of years to develop standards and best practices. Uh, and these include things like the Sequencing uh, Quality Control Consortium, uh, the Roadmap Epigenetics Map Consortium also produced a number of guidelines, the Beta Cell Biology Consortium, uh, and there are others. And on the wiki, we provide links to some of these uh, resources where if you're still in the design phase where you're thinking about how you're going to do your RNA-seq, now is a good time to think about these things, um, sort of like how many replicates do I want to use? Should I use spike and controls? Uh, and we're going to talk about some of these things uh, in reference to the tutorials where we have included a spike in control and we sort of walk you through uh, doing a, a QC analysis based on that. Um, I will say that these guidelines are very idealized, so there's sort of a list of everything that you should do, but for practical reasons or cost reasons may not be able to do, but they're you know, definitely things to really think about. Um, so I would encourage you to spend some time pouring over those. Um, as I've mentioned, there are a number of RNA-seq library construction strategies that, so these are choices that people make and uh, you should think seriously about, you know, what choice you want to make uh, because you're kind of going down a road and to some degree with regards to comparing data sets, you, you can't really go back. Um, so there are choices like, should I just sequence total RNA that's maybe be, been ribo-reduced, where we've tried to remove some of the abundant ribosomal RNAs, uh, or should I actively select for RNAs that are polyadenylated? Um, how aggressively should I size select, and, and should I do that before or after cDNA synthesis? Um, am I interested in small RNAs? So if I do a size selection that basically throws away everything that's below a certain size, you have to accept the sort of caveat that you're sort of missing out on that slice of the transcriptome. But there are advantages to, to focusing on a narrow fragment size distribution. Uh, so there's sort of a pros and cons there that need to be considered. Uh, if you have very limited material, so sometimes in some human experiments, you maybe have like biopsy material where it's like very precious amounts of sample. You may want to do some kind of amplification. So there are some kits available for linear amplification of uh, RNA-seq libraries. Uh, stranded versus unstranded libraries used to be that most RNA-seq data was unstranded. Now we're shifting towards most experiments using stranded libraries. Um, that's a really good idea if you can do it. It's great to have that strand information. Um, we sometimes capture RNA-seq libraries and enrich for RNA-seq fragments that actually correspond to known exons. Uh, this is a way to um, focus your data onto the things that you care about if you're really interested in protein coding space. Uh, it's also commonly used to rescue very uh, problematic samples. So for example, a lot of people working with FFPE tumor samples will do uh, a capture sequencing like this where they produce a normal RNA-seq library and then they basically hybridize it to an exome reagent. Uh, and then they sequence what comes off of that. Um, there are some library normalization strategies that also try to deal with this problem of having a really big difference between the most abundant RNAs and the most rare RNAs. So if you're not as interested in the sort of relative abundance of RNAs, you just want to sort of sequence the transcriptome and see what structures are there, you might want to consider one of these approaches. Uh, all of these details can vary, can affect the analysis and interpretation strategy. Uh, and if any of these things vary between the things that you intend to directly compare to each other, that can introduce bias or uh, sort of problems in your comparisons where you're seeing what you think or hope are biological differences, but really they're down to molecular biology differences that happened upstream of the analysis. So the libraries were made in a different way and they're basically 
uh, giving you sort of spurious differences that you kind of need to normalize for. Yes? You mentioned uh, particular methods to try to capture the RNAs from entities. Yeah. Can you say So um, there were a number of groups that did this in sort of a tech D phase, uh, including uh, us at WashU. Um, and it used to be done um, sort of in individual groups using an actual um, whatever exome reagent that they like to use. Now Illumina actually offers a kit specifically for this purpose. I think they call it Sure Select or something. Uh, it's all, I think it's on the wiki, which which uh, the name of the sort of the Illumina kit that people use for this purpose. Um, but the idea is um, basically with the FFP material, because your RNA is so heavily degraded, it's often uh, also limiting quantities. Um, you tend to get a, a, an output where there's a lot of noise in the data, so there's a lot of reads that are piling up in introns and intergenic space. Um, and you wind up having to sequence more deeply to get a good readout on the actual RNA sequences, so the reads that actually correspond to known transcripts. Um, and by taking that uh, cDNA uh, RNA-seq library and hybridizing it to an exome, you're really concentrating uh, all of your fragments towards things that actually correspond to known exons. Uh, and so there are, of course, caveats to this. One is that uh, you're enriching for the things you already know about, so that the exome reagent can only capture the things that it was designed to capture. It may be missing genes, it may be missing an important exon of the gene that you care about, um, and also to some degree you are um, interfering with the sort of natural um, abundance readout of the RNA-seq experiment. Um, so normally you get a lot of reads for highly abundant RNAs because they're highly abundant, and that's what you actually want. You want the readout to be a representation of the expression levels of all of the genes. When you hybridize your library to an exome reagent, to some degree you're kind of pulling up the things that were really low, and you're sort of pushing down the things that were really high, and that happens because the, the probes that you're hybridizing to in the exome reagent, to some degree, become saturated. So they can only capture so much stuff. Um, and so that results in this sort of enrichment for rare things and sort of de-enrichment of, of very abundant things. Um, we haven't actually found that effect to be very pronounced. So you can do, we've done experiments where we did standard RNA-seq and then we did uh, cDNA capture and RNA-seq and then we compared those samples with regards to how highly expressed the genes were and then for a pair of samples we did comparative differential expression analysis and we actually found that, yes, you do compress the sort of dynamic range of readout from high to lowly expressed transcripts, but you actually still get a pretty good correlation to the standard RNA-seq. The things that were the highest are still the highest. The things that were the lowest are still generally the lowest and everything in between. Um, and the reason for that is that it's actually very different, difficult to saturate the, the probes that you're capturing with. They're designed to be sort of un, impossible to saturate by having just a huge, a very high molarity. Um, this is sort of a, a, a graphic depiction of some of the concepts that we were just talking about, including sort of example readouts of Agilent assays at, at various points. Uh, so showing at the top left um, a series of RNA samples that were run on a kind of a hypothetical gel, um, showing f everything from intact uh, total RNA to partially and heavily degraded total RNA. Uh, and then if you have done an mRNA uh, enrichment, uh, you now see this range of RNA sizes instead of being dominated by the uh, ribosomal RNA peaks. Uh, and then just sort of walking through the, through the steps of starting from RNA, converting it to cDNA, doing uh, cDNA synthesis and fragmentation, uh, and then selecting for fragments of a certain size, uh, and then adding your adapters uh, to those sequences, uh, and then sending that library off to actually be sequenced on, a, on an instrument. Uh, this next uh, figure depicts sort of some of the, the differences between the different styles of uh, enrichment. Uh, so starting with uh, total RNA, you can see this depiction of uh, ribosomal RNAs being very, very abundant. Um, and then uh, below that you have ribosomal RNA reduction where you basically have probes that sort of capture the ribosomal sequences 
Uh, so you basically try to hold on to all the ribosomal RNAs and then wash through everything that isn't a ribosomal RNA, uh, effectively sort of reducing the ribosomal content uh, of your RNA sample. And then the sort of alternate approach to that is to sort of actively select for polyadenylated RNAs and to wash everything else away, which washes away the, the ribosomal RNAs, but it also <coughs> washes away other RNAs that you may care about. So there are interesting RNAs that are not polyadenylated that you may care about. Uh, and that's generally why the field has sort of moved towards the sequencing total RNA that's been ribo-reduced, because it gives you this more complete or holistic uh, representation of the transcriptome. Uh, and then the cDNA capture is sort of a depiction of that as well, where you're kind of sort of selecting for uh, the exons of known uh, genes. Okay, so we're just going to continue on. Um, a number of people sort of came up to either myself or one of the other instructors during the, the break to kind of talk about stuff that you, you're doing, details of your experiment. Just want to, in case it wasn't totally obvious, that is obviously a good idea. Please do feel free to, if you want to brainstorm about some peculiarity of what you guys are doing, then you should absolutely uh, avail yourself of that opportunity. Um, no guarantees that we'll know anything about what you're doing, but it's always interesting to hear about different kinds of RNA-seq analysis. So, uh, I think you'll find that we uh, we all benefit from that kind of thing. Um, one thing that just I was just talking to someone about a stranded versus unstranded libraries. So this is if you're having your sequencing done sort of by a core at your center or you're sending it off somewhere else, uh, sort of a good thing to kind of figure out like uh, the method that they're using, whether they whether it produces stranded or unstranded data, uh, and what that means is sort of depicted here, um, where you're going to produce some RNA seq uh, reads. Uh, and then you're going to line them back to the, the reference genome. Uh, and if your library is unstranded, um, you won't know what strand uh, each of those fragments came from. You don't know whether it was the strand that was actually being transcribed or the strand that was complementary to that. Uh, we're sequencing double-stranded cDNA. It can be either if the uh, read aligns to a known exon or it aligns across an exon-exon junction, you can start to get pretty confident that it probably came from the tr strand where that known uh, transcript is, but you don't actually know that really. Uh, you're just kind of inferring that. Uh, the stranded libraries attempt to actually maintain the information from the original single-stranded RNA, what strand it was from. Um, and they're sort of, depending on how the library is done, there's different molecular biology for how they make that work. But the, the sort of uh, important piece of it is that when, when you get your data in the end, uh, there's an expectation when it's aligned which strand it came from, and then that information can be marked in the alignment, and it can be visualized in your browser, and you'll see uh, what uh, an example like this when we look in IGB, uh, you'll see that stranded libraries, the reads that go there tend to often really line up with the strand that you would expect for the gene that they're aligning over. Um, and, and if you don't have a stranded library, you'll see this sort of equal mix of reads corresponding to the two strands. Uh, and if you're interested in, in sort of understanding, for example, sense-antisense uh, transcription patterns, you will only be able to do that if you have a uh, stranded uh, library. And most of the people generating RNA-seq data today are, are, are selecting to use uh, a stranded uh, approach. Uh, and it just it simply wasn't very possible before because the kits were uh, very experimental and had problems. But now it's sort of been, the uh, wrinkles have been ironed out. Uh, another uh, sort of issue that comes up commonly is, is replicates. Uh, should I use replicates? How many replicates? What kind of replicates? And so on. Um, there are a couple of different kind of replicates you might want to think about. Technical replicate would be, I would say, something that's sort of a replicate of the process, the sequencing process. So do I need to worry uh, that I have some data from lane one and some data from lane two, or I sequenced uh, a sample, and then later I decided I wanted a bit more data, and so it's on. Uh, I get more data from another flow cell that came a week later or a month later. Uh, generally, the Illumina platform has become quite robust and reproducible, and these kind of technical replicates uh, are not needed to sort of control for lane to lane differences or flow cell to flow cell differences. It's pretty darn consistent. Uh, we periodically sort of circle back and, and do an experiment that sort of you know, what if we just sequence the same sample on two lanes of this flow cell or two consecutive flow cells and you get really, really stellar correlations. Uh, you can basically sort of treat that part of it as a commodity now. Uh, but biological replicates, of course, are a completely different story and it just really depends on what you're doing. Uh, you absolutely want them 
Um, how many you want will depend on how much variability there is in the system that you're studying. Uh, and in some cases, it may be difficult to achieve the number of replicates that you would want uh, by statistical principles just because of the, the nature of the biology that you're studying. Um, but you should try your best to have uh, replicates and the analysis we're going to do sort of as an example will uh, assume that there is a possibility of having replicate data. Uh, some common analysis goals of RNA-seq analysis. Um, so this sort of like, what can you ask of the data? This also influences the answer to a lot of technical questions, sort of depends on what, what your goals are. Uh, so when people ask, how much data do I need, or do I, how many replicates do I need, it, it to some degree depends what you're hoping to get out of the experiment. A lot of people are doing gene expression or differential expression analysis, uh, alternative expression analysis. Maybe it's a transcript uh, discovery or annotation exercise. Uh, you're looking for allele-specific expression, or you're trying to discover mutations. Uh, in cancer, there's a lot of people uh, doing fusion detection, uh, RNA editing, and there's you know, quite a long list of, of these uh, applications. And there tends to be tools that are sort of tailored uh, to each of these areas, uh, which gives you sort of a lot of tools. You're not generally going to find a, a sort of one tool does it all. Uh, situation in the, the RNA-seq field. There's a lot of tools that are geared towards sort of uh, particular types of analysis. Uh, so that's kind of unfortunate in a way uh, because it makes the sort of analysis landscape quite complex. So to do what you might consider a comprehensive analysis of your RNA-seq data where you ask sort of all of the obvious questions or what seem like obvious questions biologically, uh, you may need to use quite a few tools, and they're all developed by different labs and different programming languages and are documented to varying degrees of crappiness and so forth. Um, so that makes it a lot of work. That's, that's why you kind of need to become a bioinformatician to some degree. Uh, but the good news is that they generally have like this sort of theme uh, to their workflow, uh, which is that they all kind of follow this pattern of obtaining raw data, maybe doing some basic quality assessment of that raw data, uh, either aligning or assembling the reads, uh, and those are different things, but they uh, sort of have a conceptual similarity. Uh, and then you're going to get an alignment or an assembly, and then you're going to process that alignment or assembly with a tool specific to your goal generally. So this is the point where things really start to diverge, where you have a tool for expression analysis and a tool for splicing analysis and a tool for allele-specific expression analysis and a tool for fusion detection and so on. Uh, and then there will be some kind of post-processing. So this tool isn't going to just write your paper for you. Uh, it will produce some crazy output files that, with their own peculiar format. Uh, and then you'll be hunting through documentation, trying to understand how to uh, interpret those files. Uh, and then you'll probably be feeding them into some kind of downstream statistical or visualization software like R or MATLAB or Cytoscape uh, or other things. And we're, so we're going to show some sort of examples of that as well. Uh, and then you'll be summarizing and visualizing uh, what comes out of those sort of, uh, sort of finishing analysis uh, platforms, uh, creating prioritized gene lists, uh, designing validation experiments, and so on. So Anne mentioned Biostars. How many people here have, have used Biostar before? OK, so about a quarter to a third of you, maybe. Um, so we just have this little exercise to just like quickly, in five minutes, uh, check out uh, the Biostar website just so you all have a familiarity with it. Uh, if you don't have a, an account, I would encourage you to actually create an account. Uh, you will need to do that in order to ask a question down the road. It's really easy if you already have a Google uh, or Yahoo or whatever account, you just like click a button and authorize uh, Biostars to use that system for its authorization, so you don't really need to create a new account in that sense. Um, and then just spend a few minutes, so we'll literally do it for just like four or five minutes. Um, try to search for a question that seems uh, uh, useful to you um, and give it a vote or something just to kind of see how the interface uh, works. Um, so generally when, when these courses end we often get uh, questions from students and we generally encourage the question to be asked in Biostars and then we'll answer it there um, just as a way of sort of publicly answering that question so that other people can benefit from it. Uh, and so that we don't keep repeating the same sort of question answer uh, kind of sessions. Uh, and it's also a good way to get sort of feedback from the community to, to potentially get sort of updated answers to common questions over time. Um, and it's by far the most popular uh, sort of bioinformatics question answer forum, I would say, out there.
Okay, so maybe we'll just go through the last few slides uh, and start to get closer to where we can actually do the hands-on uh, exercise, the first hands-on exercise. Uh, so you've just seen kind of a uh, forum where you can uh, ask and answer questions. Uh, we're just the last few slides are just going through some of the most common questions, just to sort of get them out there. Uh, just because by experience we've been asked these questions over and over again, uh, so it's good to maybe uh, have just have a brief discussion about each of them, uh, and then if you have any sort of follow-up questions, you can ask them, and uh, everyone can participate in that discussion. Uh, the first is: Should I rem du remove duplicates for RNA seq? A lot of people who have done whole genome or exome or other kinds of sequencing, um, chip seq, almost all of the other types of seq, it's very, very, very standard practice to mark duplicates uh, after you align your reads. So what this means, you're going to align your reads to the re to the reference genome, uh, and then any read alignment that starts and ends at the same position, or even just starts at the same position, uh, is going to be marked as a duplicate uh, under the assumption that it's possible that that alignment is actually a, a PCR amplification artifact and not a unique observation of a distinct fragment from your sample. Um, and the reason you can do this in whole genome sequencing is that, uh, for example, using whole genome sequencing as an example, uh, you're sequencing the genome and you're getting, say, 30 to 40x coverage across the reference genome, and each of those reads consists of a paired end uh, fragment where you have, say, 100 bases that aligned here and 100 bases that aligned here, and then maybe 100 bases in between, so you have a 300 base fragment. Uh, the probability that two independent fragments would start and end at the same place, have the exact same insert, everything identical, uh, is very low in terms of sort of the random sampling of molecules. Um, so when you do see duplicates like that, it's more likely that they're actually just uh, duplicates that were introduced during amplification, during library construction. So you mark those, you choose one as a representative, and then you ignore the rest of them. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of workflows out there, sort of best practices based on, say, the Picard analysis toolkit or other toolkits where they just, without really even thinking about it, just say, oh, remove your duplicates, mark your duplicates, this is something, of course, you would do. It's very important. Everyone just do it. Uh, but the one place where that's not really a good idea is RNA-seq. Um, so it, it's maybe a more complicated question for RNA-seq than it is for DNA, uh, and people who aren't doing RNA sequencing uh, don't necessarily appreciate that. And the concern is that um, because of some of the sort of unique characteristics of RNA sequencing before, uh, removing duplicates that, uh, that you think are potentially PCR amplification, they could actually be real duplicates that just happened by chance. Uh, so think about a really highly expressed uh, short gene. Uh, so say you have a gene that's only 400 bases long, uh, and it's a very, it makes a very important but short protein, uh, and it's very, very highly expressed, so it's almost ubiquitously expressed in, in the cells that you're studying. Uh, if you think about that 400 uh, base RNA uh, molecule, there's not actually that many ways to make a unique fragment out of it. Because it's short and because there's so, so many of them in the cell, you actually expect duplicates to happen just because of its abundance and its short length. So anything that's really abundant, you start to worry that you're seeing duplicates just because you're sampling very highly, and you're sampling highly because it really is abundant. Uh, and so in that scenario, if you mark them and decide to ignore them, you're actually underestimating the abundance of that RNA. So you're basically putting a ceiling on the dynamic range of expression readout that you can get from your experiment that prevents you from accurately representing the difference between lowly expressed things and highly expressed things. So for that reason, people generally don't mark duplicates uh, in RNA-seq data. Um, so that comes with the caveat that you may have uh, amplification artifacts making their way through, but that's probably a lesser evil. Um, Another common question is how much library depth do we need? Probably this is the most common question, uh, and just good reasons for asking this question, probably the most obvious being uh, it influences cost. So Illumina data costs more for more data. Um, and so generally you want to uh, balance uh, the need for deep uh, sequencing against the need to have more replicates or to just be able to afford the experiment at all or be able to do other things with that money in your lab. Um, and But to answer the question how much you actually need, it really depends on a number of factors. Um, so for example, it depends on what question you're asking of the data. Uh, so if you're doing gene expression analysis, this is something that pr probably places the one of the least demands on sequencing depth. 
Uh, and the reason is that you're just trying to get kind of a readout of the relative and absolute abundance of transcripts. A lot of these transcripts are fairly large. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, fragments that can be derived from those transcripts. You can kind of get a readout of the relative abundance of transcripts without completely plastering every transcript from end to end with 50x or greater coverage. Um, but when you start to do things like alternative expression analysis or identifying individual point mutations, it starts to mean that you actually, you don't just want a bunch of reads to hit each transcript, you want every transcript to be covered nice and deeply from end to end, even lowly expressed transcripts. And that means the total amount of data you need to generate goes up in order to achieve that kind of coverage. Yeah. Um, well, you change it simply by sequencing more. Um, so this in practice means you're either, um, so often uh, you will pool three or four or 10 samples into a single lane of Illumina. So the amount of pooling you do influences the total amount of data that you get out. Um, and if you want even more data than you would get in one lane, then you might decide to do two lanes of sequencing or a whole flow cell for one sample. So that's sort of the way you uh, adjust the total amount of data you get uh, and then in terms of assessing it, um, generally uh, you can just assess the number of reads that were generated, of course, um, uh, but a lot of people will also align those reads uh, to the reference genome and then do some kind of um, assessment of how many mapped reads there were or how many splice mapped reads there were, depending on the, the kind of question they're asking. And we're going to sort of, we're going to do that kind of basic QC uh, in the hands-on exercises. So you can definitely know how much data you're going to get from a lane because that's like published knowledge that's based on the so the instrument. Um, it depends a little bit on which platform of Illumina you're using, whether it's a 4,000 or a 2,000 or 2,500 or a MySeq. Um, but you can just, that information is readily available. Um, there are papers, so in the, there's a resources section in the RNA-seq wiki that we're going to uh, go through, and there are some papers that have specifically addressed this question that's sort of like, okay, I mostly care about gene expression, uh, how many reads should I target, and sort of what is the balance between more depth on one sample versus having more replicates of, uh, to compare, um, based on some basic assumptions. Um, and the kind of uh, numbers that have come out of those experiments are things like you generally want like 20 to 40 million reads per sample for just simple gene expression analysis, assuming you don't have any major like sample quality issues. And this is after interview, right? So long? That's, yeah, coming out, that's aligned reads. So reads that actually successfully align to the genome. Before, Which will often be about 95%. Yes. Yeah. So that's assuming you've gone all the way through. Um, but of course, the caveat is that that's for like a kind of a focused question. That's sort of like gene expression estimation. And the the trade off with with replicates is also assuming that you have more. So if you have a hundred samples in the freezer. Um, People will generally argue that you're better off to try to sequence some amount of all 100 of those samples rather than to have really great coverage of 20 of them, um, unless you're going below that sort of 20 to 40 million read threshold and assuming that you are interested in just gene expression analysis. So where you're kind of get, you're hoping to get almost like a microarray ex expression kind of readout. Um, but of course, as soon as you start asking other questions of the data, then you may find that that level is, is inadequate. Um, I can tell you that what we do for our um, sort of precision medicine style experiments with patient tumors, we still generally sequence uh, either a whole lane or maybe half a lane on today's instruments. So there, here it says one to two lanes, um, but now the 
capacity has increased to the point where it's probably two samples per lane that we're often doing, one, one or two, depending on RNA quality. And that gives you, if everything works out well, that gives you the ability to do a lot with that data. So you can do gene expression analysis, but you can also assemble a transcriptome, you can do splicing analysis, you can have a pretty good confidence of detecting whether a particular SNP was expressed in a particular gene, unless that gene is very, very lowly expressed. You can do most of the kinds of things that we're talking about wanting to do with RNA-seq with about a half a lane of data now on the, the latest instrument, and, which is you know still a non-trivial expense, so that'll cost you I don't know, six, seven, eight hundred dollars maybe. Can you detect small RNAs in RNA-seq? Question is, can you detect small RNAs in RNA-seq data? Uh, the answer is um, yes, but it depends. Um, really small RNAs are usually um, processed completely differently. So most people that are do interested in um, microRNA analysis will generally make a microRNA library, which is made quite differently from a sort of standard RNA-seq library. Not crazy complicated or anything, but it's pretty typical in a, a, a normal RNA-seq library to do a size exclusion step um, after library construction, which will actually remove a lot of small RNAs. And this is done kind of on purpose to remove like a bunch of small things that are abundant. Um, and people that are interested in protein coding genes are generally willing to just toss all that stuff away because it improves the quality of data for the rest of the transcriptome. Um, and it also makes it easier to load the instrument. Uh, so one of the things that the, the Illumina instruments um, work best actually with a relatively tight size distribution for fragments. So if the fragments are all around say 250 to 300 bases, um, it's easier to balance the cl cluster density on the in instrument so that you can um, put the optimal, optimal amount of fragments onto the flow cell while still getting good quality data. So if you overload the flow cell so that you have fragments that are just like everywhere, they start to overlap each other and this actually interferes with the running of the instrument. It, it uh, introduces chimeric reads, sequencing errors, etc. So you want the flow cell to be to some degree sort of sparsely populated. So I showed a picture um, of a flow cell yeah, you can kind of see in the background here, each of these dots is a cluster of molecules on the physical flow cell that are being imaged from above while the sequencing by synthesis reaction is happening. Uh, and if those points get too close together, it starts to interfere with the sequencing quality. Um, and if you have a mix of fragment sizes, um, it makes it harder to, to get that balance right. Uh, there's a sort of like bias to, towards smaller fragments um, forming clusters more uh, easily um, and so you actually wind up disfavoring fragments that are larger which produce generally higher quality uh, reads. Um, so almost everyone sort of makes that division that if you're interested in small RNA you're going to do a small RNA library. If you're interested in the rest of RNA you're going to do a sort of standard RNA-seq library which involves removing small things. If you're interested in both you're going to do both of those things not in one shot. You'll sort of split the experiment into two. What uh, chimeric read is where uh, you have a read pair, uh, and the, it's supposed to be that the first read corresponds to the beginning of your physical cDNA fragment, and the second read corresponds to the, the end of the same fragment. Uh, chimeric read is where you have uh, the two reads are actually from different fragments, but they've been uh, erroneously paired together during the sequencing. Um, so you get like, it looks like a read, read one corresponds to one gene and read two corresponds to a different gene in a completely different area, maybe on a different chromosome. Uh, and that could really be from like a translocation event, but you get a bunch of artifactual um, chimeric reads like that when you, when certain things happen during library construction or the running of the instrument. Um, and you can also have partial chimeric reads where part of the read is um, corresponding to one gene and the other part is corresponding to another gene and it's not from real biology, it's from something that went wrong during library construction or sequencing. And that makes your data very not good. Yeah. Any other questions about that? Yes? Um, why if I want to pull the RNA-seq data, should I need the scan read for each of the same sample? 
if you want to pool them. Yeah, like for the one set to the other set, should I need the same grid for each of them? Like between uh, 30 million for this and 30 million for this? Or I see. I can be 30 or 40. Should the depth be equal? Um, so say you have three samples for condition A and three samples for condition B. So the simplest experimental design uh, is, of course, to kind of do everything the same. Um, if it works out that um, you wind up with 30 million for one and 40 million and then 35 million, um, the analysis methods are going to account for those differences in library size and generally it won't make a big difference. If you sort of systematically have less data for one of your conditions than you do for the other condition, then you will, in a sense, be, you have sort of differential sensitivity. So you may be able to discover things better in one condition than another condition, and that's not optimal. But it won't really prevent you from doing the analysis. It's, it's not the end of the world, as long as it's not too extreme. Um, you just, you wouldn't want it to be a scenario where one of your samples, you didn't have sufficient depth to really do the experiment properly in those samples. And you ideally don't want a systematic difference between the things that you're comparing, because um, that will potentially introduce sort of bias that needs to be normalized. Um, but if it's a little bit kind of variable here and there, it's, not, it's fine. Um, you don't need to throw away reads, for example, to like make sure they're balanced or anything like that. Um, usually you can just deal with the minor differences like during the analysis, and it'll happen automatically with a lot of these tools. Any other depth related questions? Yes. So I know this is hard to answer, but if you have two samples, you get differential expression. And if you see the expression in one sample and not the other, cancer normal is the typical um, example. Uh, is there a way to really have a sanity check whether or not you don't see the expression in the sample because it's not expressed, or you just didn't have no well, unless there is some problem with the complexity of that sample, you can make a very, very strong statistical argument that were it there, it would have been seen. Um, unless something has really gone wrong. If you have 100 million reads for your normal and 100 million reads for your tumor, and you see sort of globally a sort of comparable readout that generally you see the same genes being expressed, but in a particular gene you see none of it in the normal and lots of it in the tumor, unless something has gone wrong, that should not, <laughs> that should not happen unless it really was being well, suppressed yeah. in that sample. And then of course you can do a validation experiment if you're not convinced, but um, RNA-seq has become so robust and so widely used that actually even a lot of manuscript reviewers are not really asking for like, oh, qPCR validation. I, we actually have to, I used to have like two slides that were like, basically, should I believe any of this? Um, and we actually took them out this year because everyone believes it now. Um, but there is, um, there's a reference to a paper that where we did a bunch of these validation experiments to tr try to convince the skeptics. And that's also referenced in the wiki for if you if you encounter that problem. Um, but there, there are a few weird scenarios where you can get um, this happening because of something that went wrong in the analysis. So it's worth being, you know, skepticism is good. Um, I mean, usually this is the case when you don't have a hundred million reads. Yeah, so then the statistical argument gets weaker and weaker the, the, the smaller the sampling is. Um, but these methods that do these analyses are supposed to be taking that into account. And they are generally quite conservative, actually. Um, and like, is there a set of genes that are, let's say, relatively, have relatively low like, stable expression across tissues that you could use to check for? Hmm, that's an interesting question. So sort of like the housekeeping gene idea, yeah, so. except things that are low. Give you it. That's a good idea. 
I'm not a, I haven't seen someone who like assembled a set like that. That's like, hey, use these genes. I, we have used this concept in a kind of anecdotal way by looking actually at the telomerase gene. So telomerase is kind of famous. It's a little bit gets a little bit complicated in tumor analysis because you expect telomerase maybe to be upregulated. But even when upregulated, it tends to be expressed at a very low level compared to other genes. Um, and in a normal cell, it's there at like a few copies per cell. So it's a good example of a gene like that where you have this like a priori expectation that it will be functional, important, but there at a relatively low copy number. So if you see decent coverage of that, it gives you confidence that you're actually detecting low copy number transcripts robustly. Um, but it would be nice if it was a little bit less anecdotal. If it was like 50 or 100 of those, you could get a better sense. Um, another thing that we're going to walk through is the concept of a spike in. So you can spike in a series of sort of artificially constructed sequences, including ones that are at a very, very low level, to give you a sense like, okay, I know this thing was in my pool at a very low level relative to everything else, and I'm still able to detect it. So I, it makes me more confident that uh, I know kind of where the sensitivity uh, drop-off is for my experiment. And that's one of the things that's great about doing those experiments is that it kind of gives you that, that confidence. Um, in terms of sort of analysis artifacts, um, if you don't see a gene or you see it at very, very low uh, copy number and you sort of want to make yourself a little bit more confident that it isn't some kind of um, just artifact of, of tool breaking or something, um, something you can do is actually um, visually inspect the alignments and make sure that you see some alignments in that region and not literally zero. Because the thing about RNA-seq data is that it's sort of fundamentally noisy and actually the transcriptional machinery is itself noisy. So you generally expect a low level scattering of noise everywhere. And so if you see a big desert, then you might worry like, hmm, maybe the alignments are not working here or there's something wrong with my reference genome or somehow it was filtered out in some kind of automated step. Uh, and then that's giving me a spurious sort of zero expression value that's actually not real. And that, that can happen and we'll talk about a specific um, example of that in the uh, for cufflinks actually. What I can say is you can look for uh, into public databases to see whether the gene is expressed in normal tissues or not. So the best data which I figured out was GTEx data, which has 17 different tissues from human samples. What data? GTEx. So GTEx is a consortium that's building a kind of normal tomb tissue atlas of RNA seq expression. Uh, the sequencing is being done at the Broad, um, and they are depositing uh, in dbGaP uh, and uh, some of the information is just available directly on their uh, project website. So you can download this sort of compendium of RNA-seq across a number of individuals from uh, a number of tissues, uh, and they have corresponding genome sequence data for those same individuals so that if you want to understand some relationship between sort of alleles and expression values, you can start to do that kind of analysis. Um, and it's a large data set, um, but it, it's probably worth um, applying for access. And um, and I think you can just get sort of FPKM values that where that simple analysis has sort of been pre-calculated, where you don't actually have to run it all through like a pipeline. Um, FPKM values are free to everybody, so you don't have to right. get access to it. Yeah. So you could use that data file to select your set of 50 commonly but lowly expressed things or to play around with that idea. Yeah, that's a good point. Any other questions? Um, okay. Uh, mapping strategy. Uh, so I asked earlier about the length of the reads. We used, it used to be that we had kind of a mix of really short reads and, and longer reads and that would influence the alignment strategy you would take because of this, this challenge that I mentioned about aligning reads across large introns. Um, but this problem is kind of going away as everyone is sort of consolidated on reads that are at least, say, 75 to 100 bases long. That's enough to give you a pretty decent chance of aligning across uh, large introns some reasonable amount of the time. Uh, so generally, we're going to be just focusing on uh, spliced aligners. There are a number of spliced aligner options that have sort of different advantages and disadvantages, um, but we're not going to explore any more this, this earlier concept of using a, a non-spliced aligner because most people just don't have that data. Um, but it, it, if you're interested in that, we can talk about it as well. Yeah? Uh, for example, 
example, the raw reads will be a 101 pages, like 100 pages in the data. But after trimming the data, some of them, some of the reads might be shorter, like uh, 30 to, if you are setting the uh, uh, read then whatever is minimum then 30 in this target. So it will be the range from 30 to 101. So in that case, like uh, uh, some of, like it's not equally uh, distributed. Mm -hmm. I guess in that case, it depends on what that distribution looks like. Um, so if after trimming, most of your reads look like, like they started all to be 100 and most of them are below 50 after trimming, I would wonder what happened there, first of all. Um, it's possibly the size of fragments that were fed into the experiment in the first place was problematic. Um, or maybe it was somehow, maybe small things are being targeted on purpose. In which case, yeah, once you get into that range where, say, over half of your reads or 50 bases or lower, you're probably going to want to start thinking about a non-spliced alignment option. If, say, more than half to, of your reads are over, say, 75 to 100 bases, then I would still stick with the, the spliced alignment uh, option. Um, and if you're kind of in a gray zone, you might tr try a pilot like analysis where you did both ways and you kind of compared the results. Yeah, that's a good point. Trimming is sort of potentially changes the landscape of things from your raw data to your, your trim data. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about trimming in the hands-on exercises as well. Uh, everyone, almost everyone had a reference genome. Uh, if you don't have a reference genome, it does introduce a challenge. Um, you should encourage the powers that be to sequence the genome of your critter or plant or whatever, or do it yourself. Um, Sometimes that's just really, really hard um, or very expensive and you just have to get by without it. Uh, but there are a number of tools out there that um, are reference free. Um, and some of them were designed by people who actually didn't have a reference. Uh, in other cases, it's just sort of luck that someone designed an approach that doesn't use the reference for performance reasons. And we're gonna show an example of that, a tool called Callisto. Uh, which doesn't rely on the reference genome and is able to uh, sort of simplify the problem by not aligning to a reference genome and produce an RNA-seq out analysis output in a much, much shorter time than the workflow that we're going to show you. Um, it doesn't sort of cover all of the same analysis bases that this workflow does, but if you just care about gene expression estimation, it's a pretty good option, uh, and it may be a, your only option if you don't have a reference genome. Um, this is on so that the I guess you guys have a printout so you can't click on the link um, but the, all of these slides are available on the wiki uh, and the wiki also includes a list of the supplementary tables um, this supplementary table refers to uh, a manuscript uh, that we wrote actually for sort of to describe this workshop last year uh, and that's what the supplementary tables are referring to. And on the RNA-seq wiki, there's like a citation page that includes links to all the supplementary tables. Okay. Um, so each of the, the hands-on work exercises or tutorials has a corresponding slide deck. Um, and these are kind of like reference materials to sort of refer back to you while you're doing the, the workshop. Um, I'm just going to really blast through it quickly because I feel like we've already had so many slides and it would be more fun to get into actually doing stuff at the command line. Um, but the first one has a bit of sort of ge just generic information, um, sort of summary of the learning objectives here. So what we're going to do is um, walk through the exercise of installing a bunch of bioinformatics tools, which is sort of an art to that. Um, you'll see kind of how that goes. Um, and then we're going to start obtaining sort of the, the prerequisite input materials to an RNA-seq analysis. So we're going to obtain a reference genome sequence. We're going to download gene transcript annotations and talk about the, the file formats that are involved here. We're going to index the reference genome to be used with an aligner. So this is a way of basically organizing the information that's in the reference genome in a way that allows al alignment to happen very efficiently. Um, the index is, you know, it's very much like an index uh, in, a, in a library. Uh, and then we're going to download the, the sequence data that we're going to use for the, the exercises. So we have some, this demonstration data that's been set up uh, for you guys to play around with. Um, some common problems that I encounter while working on these tutorials. So all this is going to happen uh, in the command line. 
Um, we'd encourage you to, to type the short commands carefully uh, if you like, but uh, we've learned that sort of from the past in order to get through all the steps smoothly, you may want to really copy and paste some of the long commands just because they're so long uh, and to help us get through. We're also, at, at strategic points, we're going to have uh, sort of practical exercises where you're not given the commands at all and you're going to be required to figure them out, type them out on your own. Um, but to get through the sort of demonstration of this whole working pipeline, uh, you really, every step relies on the previous steps. Uh, so for these big, long, like multi-line commands, you're really probably just easiest uh, to avoid headaches to just uh, copy and paste them. Uh, a common So there's errors related to the copy and pasting that sometimes happen where you don't quite select the whole thing when you copy it and then you paste part of it and generally that doesn't work out too well. So try to make sure that you're copying the entire command when you do that. Uh, being in the wrong directory at the wrong time. So a lot of these commands are assuming you're going to operate on some files in the current directory. You're going to create an alignment command and then you're going to summarize those files. If you move out of that directory between steps where when the tutorial didn't ask you to do that, the command might fail because it's sort of built with the expectation that you're in a particular location at a particular time. So just be cognizant of that if you're kind of navigating around and seeing, okay, I want to look at the results that are in this directory. Um, but if you weren't asked to do that, try to remember to go back to where you were before moving on to the next step. Uh, and you'll see in the tutorials there's a lot of places where there's like uh, a change directory command that's intended to kind of put you back where you need to be in case you have kind of wandered off. Um, there's a, we're going to set this RNA home variable. Sometimes that isn't set, so that can cause problems. We'll show you how to do that. Um, the presentation, uh, this presentation provides a really brief description of some of the steps, but the wiki has more complete instructions. Uh, and then in the wiki, when you see this hashtag or, or pound sign, uh, those are comments, so they're interpreted at a command line just as a comment and nothing is executed. So you can safely paste those in or you can just uh, read them and ignore them. Um, but all the other lines that are in these sort of code blocks that you'll see in the wiki are things that need to be executed uh, in order to work your way through the, the hands-on exercises. Uh, and then we've tried to annotate uh, commands with sort of comments that explain what's going on, but uh, a basic familiarity with Linux is assumed. Uh, however, if you see a command that has options or you don't understand what's going on, uh, we're happy to sort of walk through what, what each command means and what each of the individual components of it are. Uh, these are some of the tools we're going to install. Just for reference, there's some links there that, in case you want to read more of the documentation on each of them. Uh, we're going to obtain a reference genome. Uh, and then for this exercise, we're, we're just going to use a single chromosome, but nothing about what we're doing would really change if we were using the whole reference genome. It would just be slower. Uh, but all the commands would basically stay the same. Uh, so this is sort of a reasonable demonstration. Uh, we're going to obtain known transcript annotations. And again, these will be genes that are annotated on the same chromosome that we're focusing our analysis on. And we've chosen a small chromosome to also make the analysis go faster so we're not waiting a long time for commands. Um, we're going to get annotations, gene annotations from a particular place, the iGenomes project, uh, but there are lots of sources of these annotations and it to some degree will vary on, depending on what species you're studying. Uh, and we're going to talk about the, the file formats that are used to describe these gene annotations. Uh, we're going to create an index reference genome, as I mentioned. Uh, the one sort of uh, thing to remember about these indexes is that they're generally particular to the alignment algorithm. So each alignment algorithm builds one of the in these indexes and they're not interoperable generally. So if you use different aligners, you'll generally see there's this pattern of producing an index uh, for that aligner. And sometimes even different versions of the same aligner, you may need to produce a new index of your reference genome uh, to work with a new version of the aligner. Uh, the RNA-seq data, so I mentioned this briefly before, we have uh, sort of two RNA sources uh, for the RNA-seq data. So these are samples that we sequenced at WashU uh, for the purposes of having data to play around with uh, at this course. Uh, one is the Universal Human Reference, which will be abbreviated UHR throughout, uh, and then the Human Brain Reference, which will be abbreviated HBR. Uh, and then each of these samples has a spike in, so this is a series of control sequences that I mentioned. So there's about 100 sequences that are, I believe they're bacterial, um, and they're spiked in uh, as a set, but they've been designed so that they sort of cover a range of abundances. So there's sequences that are in there at very high copy number, there are other sequences at very low copy number, and a bunch of steps in between, and the, the ratio uh, is known, so because it was created artificially, we know 
uh, the ratio of all of these uh, molecules to each other. Uh, and then there are two mixes. There's mix one and mix two. Uh, and in mix one and mix two, they've adjusted the sort of order. So something that's highly abundant in mix one, you have the same sequence in mix two, but they put it at a lower abundance and vice versa. So this allows you to do both a sort of assessment of the absolute expression readout uh, across the series of sort of standards, as well as a differential uh, comparison where in both cases you have a prior expectation about what sequences are the most abundant and the least abundant, and you also have an expectation when you do this comparison between the two mixes that there will be expected differential expression fold change values between the two mixes. Um, so it's just more inf background information on these, uh, sort of the biology and, and source of these uh, samples that are used for the example data. Um, and we're going to do some pre-alignment QC. So this is something we get a lot of questions about, sort of how do I know if my data is any good? So we're going to try to sort of walk through some of those points uh, as well in the, in the first exercise. Uh, and that's it.